Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 32 of Run to the Hills. How are you doing, Gaza? Can I call you Gaza? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah, you are. You know, not many people call me Gaza. (laughs) Awkward. Yeah, no, no, I'll take Gaza. I don't mind. Um, I am well, thanks. A lovely Easter weekend, actually. Um, Oh, how was your Easter weekend? We did. uh, Right, so let's start. We oh gosh, are... here we go. Cup of tea, everybody. Here we go. <laughs> what do we do? Well, the family time. You know, we we went to see my dad on Sunday. We had a kind of family um, little buffet, and we we're in the the weather was okay, so that was fine. A bit breezy, but all right. And went for a family walk too, which was nice down the Dean. Um, and I went to the Lake District with my friend Neil and did a leg one recce, and then we <gasps> ran back to Keswick via the new it must have been the old railway line which was i think trashed quite a few years ago with some heavy rain some bridges came down lakeland 100 runners and people know about that Mm, um mm. and but that's all back up and running now so we did that leg one so skidor great calver and blen cathra and for those bob graham round geeks we came down doddick fell how did you feel? Well, we, we are not going for any record time, Bob Graham round. We've got kind of 22 hours in our mind. And we were slightly up on that. So that was nice. And we finished at Threlkeld and then we ran back to Keswick and we both felt okay. We, we, you know, we chatted all the way. Yeah, really good. Can't, can't complain at all. I did have doms, which I've not had for quite a long time. On... I was going to ask you that next day, did you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Legs, the, tell the, the story. The, the, the doms and my massage good not turned up, which was which was good. But the postman gave it up. He did. He he finished with it. Um, but it was quite it was quite quite painful on my quads with the doms. So, yeah, calves love the massage gun, but the doms weren't so keen. But painful, yeah, really, but nice. Is this something you're no. putting into your? Oh, oh yes, I will. I'll, I'll definitely put yeah. it in the routine, but not when I've kind of got doms as a result of a big run. Too much, it's too much, yeah. yeah. But it was great, yeah, really nice to be out on the fells. We went over to Keswick nice and early, kind of anticipating a really busy Keswick with the sunshine in the bank holiday weekend, and it was really quiet. So very pleasant indeed. We had a lovely vegetable pasty and a cup of coffee in the market square afterwards and uh, then drove back home. Brilliant, really, really nice. And yourself? Yeah, we had a lovely, we had, set. We had beautiful weather, beautiful sunshine um, over the Easter weekend. S- unfortunately, slightly tired by the fact that we've been put back into a strict lockdown and the oh schools have been shut and everything's, it's slightly hung over my head all weekend, this black cloud of doom that was approaching. Oh. Not for not for any reason apart from, I think probably a lot of people can relate to this, is it the flashbacks of the previous lockdown? I was like, oh, I'm yeah. not sure I can do this again. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. But but um, so far, it's a lot less strict than our previous lockdowns. So we yeah. don't need these forms to fill in. As long okay. as we're not going, we can go 10K. We can go out for as long as we want. Yeah. Um, they've shut all the shops, but then we didn't have anything open here anyway. Okay. So yeah. there's no shops. There's nothing. There's been nothing here open for a, for a month anyway. So that's not, you know, that's no different. And the fact I can still go out with the kids is huge. Last because yeah. last time we were only allowed out. If I went out for a run in the morning, I technically then wasn't meant to go out again with the kids in the whole day. We were meant to stay inside. Oh wow. So it was that strict, but um so I had to do a lot of treadmill running last time. But so this time you can go out, you know, we could go out all day as long as we're in our 10K. So okay. that's less onerous, whether they'll yeah. change that. Because, of course, we went out then, we took the kids to, the, they like going on their scooters and their skateboards to the skate park. And so did everybody else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, oh, not, you know, we're so used to those lockdowns here being, re- you know, you don't see anybody. Yeah. So I'm not sure whether it will work because people will be a lot less um, stringent, but especially without the these papers because they they really frightened me like you know you had to have this paper all printed out had to exact uh, otherwise and the police were out you know they were they were driving up and down golf buggies up and down oh the tracks to and you had to carry that around with you. you you had to fa- carry it and i had a special cart to say you know a, a cut pro to say that i was an athlete so i was allowed to go a little bit further i was allowed to train but even yeah. carrying that i'd be like so i've still got to explain myself they're going to want to go through and check <laughs> yeah <laughs> Get i didn't enjoy it so there's a slight less fear but um yeah and the kids have got no school so we've just done a morning of homeschooling i've 
feel a little exhausted. <laughs> three of them. <laughs> oh, three of them. <laughs> mummy, 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 but mummy this, mummy that. Yeah. But God, and, I, and it's French and the grammar. It's the grammar, oh. French grammar. I mean, oh my lord. English I'm not even grammar. very good at English grammar, let alone French. I know, I know. We didn't, we weren't taught it, were we? Fractions, French, fra oh. <laughs> so there's a did lot of my, circles on the Did you, did you see my typo on the Instagram? Oh, I would have never mentioned that. <laughs> it's gone. Nobody can see it now. It's gone. <laughs> no one will. No. So it's quite anyway, spectacular. I'm, try yeah. I, I'm trying to be positive. We had a lovely Easter weekend. The sun shone, the birds sang, the Easter bunny arrived in full force. We had oh, a lovely yes. family time. And now it's the next month is all about staying alive, being kind to yourself, yep. uh, and trying to fit in everything and not um, not exhausting myself. We'll talk about that a bit after our interview. Uh, let's talk about the competition. Very popular competition. Yes, it was really good. Basically, how do you recover and rest? You know, very good, some very descriptive and some very visual examples of how people rest. I'm a sucker for an image. Yeah, my, my favorite was Melinda Marshall. I just loved the getting down on the sofa with the brew, feet up. Toes out, she was not doing anything after that photograph was taken. It was fantastic. Yeah, so well done. Melinda. Free recovery. If you can get it, loads of great things. I loved it. I love the, uh, the the heavy theme was just being able to lie down. With Lots tea. of tea. Lots of tea consumed. It's the best bit. It's the yeah. best bit after a long yeah. run, isn't it? My husband often said, if I go out for a long run at the weekend and I come back and I sit, I mean, this is disgusting, but I'll sit in my kit and have a cup of tea. And he'll be like, go and have a shower. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is the best <laughs> bit. The sitting down and a cup of tea and I'll have the shower. I'll prolong, you know, the, the cleansing process. <laughs> I need two oh or my three goodness. hours. <laughs> Move up to the shower, have a shower. Then I'll sit on the bed for a bit for quite a long time, staring at, you know, the post long run stairs. <laughs> and then hunger will drag. I like to drag out that recovery until then I'm like, mom, can we go? Can we go to the park? We're going to the park now. Are we going now? <laughs> what about a salty bath? Do you like a salt bath? Have you done that one yet? Oh, if I try and get in the bath when the kids are here, this yeah. is carnage. Can I come in? Am I coming in? Are we going in? <laughs> then the dogs will come in. Then All they'll right. be like, I'm going to get the dolls. I'm going to get the dolls to come in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. no time that's, for that. Sadly. That's not a relaxation. I've heard good things. No, we do have though, because I've mentioned it before, right by the river. And so it's constantly flowing and it's glacial water. Ooh, so yeah. if I, in the summer, if I'm feeling super hardcore, I will go and sit in that and put my Ooh. legs in that. For um, I'm not good in the cold water though. I know it's meant to be really good for you, but it doesn't feel good to me. Is it? it I think it's painful. a bit kind of hit and miss that data these days isn't it the, it's the very um it's very fashionable it's going through a fashion phase isn't it <clears throat> it is nice i remember did a, one of the lakeland trail races a few years ago and it was insanely hot and to spend 20 minutes in coniston after that was oh my goodness me it was magic i think an ice cream as well it was uh Whoa. it was a magical 20 minutes. i think probably i'm challenging myself with the glacial water perhaps <laughs> i need to start a little lower the kids just go in it i mean they just get in it they, they they spend half their time in it they don't seem to feel it and i just get my toes in and go oh no 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 so yeah melinda we will get in touch with you but if we haven't then send myself or eddie a message on facebook or instagram or wherever you can reach us and give us a nudge and then we'll get a box of cheer charge goodies off to you we had a great interview this week i reckon this is it this is the moment when we're going to go viral with this interview gary yeah she was pretty special wasn't she we um we were quite nervous about interviewing uh our next guest alicia mccorgan who is a cheer charge tim likes to sponsor an elite athlete uh every few years i think he's sort of uh, he's very he's very canny that tim yeah. um and he he cho he's chosen wisely because not only is she a um really savvy on social he likes that you know social media she replies she's on it she doesn't yeah. just post it. it's re it's real but she's also a real um as we found out what a role model for some a young person her yeah. journey and how hard she works and how dedicated her whole team is and how professional she is. Yeah. Gosh. It's good she got a nice Me. support network around her by the sounds of things. Sensible head on her shoulders. Shall we listen to the interview? Yes. Let's get straight into it.
we are delighted to welcome to the podcast uh, Elish McColgan uh, today. Gary and I are both quite nervous. We've got a superstar in our midst. Um, if you don't know anything about Elish, or um, we're obviously not used to having, well, I want to say speedy, but also um, a lady of such caliber of running. She represented Great Britain at the 2012 Olympic Games and the 2016 Games in Rio. She's represented Scotland at the Commonwealth Games in 2014 and 2018. She's the Scottish record holder in the 3000 meter steeplechase and recently ran 30 minutes, 58 seconds for the 10,000 meters qualifying for the Tokyo Olympics. Elise, did I get that all right? Yes, yes. I'm not qualified just yet. I ran a qualifying time. Qualifying time. Yeah, I would love to have qualified there and then, but um, yeah, there's a little bit more work to do yet. Welcome, welcome to the show. Can you tell us where you are at the moment? Currently in uh, Colorado Springs, which is around about 6,000 feet um, altitude over in Colorado. Um, so yeah, we've been here just two weeks now. Um and yeah, it's been, despite the snowstorms, uh, it's been nice to just get a, a really good block of training in here. Have you trained there before? Yeah, so we actually came out here last year for the first time. Um, we hadn't planned to come to Colorado Springs. We were training in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a lot where, to be honest, a lot of British athletics mm, go. Yeah. Um, but due to the pandemic, our flights actually got cancelled. Um, we travelled out just five days or something before coronavirus hit um so we ended up actually stuck in america and the only way for us to get home was a flight from colorado so it wasn't planned but we decided to drive uh, sort of two states and just to i suppose just take a look at it before we we traveled home um, and we just loved it here we loved the the running and um, the people were so kind when we were out training um so yeah, we decided to come out uh, again this year. Are there lots of athletes out there? Are you sort of um, amongst other people training? Do you know what? Not as much as Flagstaff. Flagstaff really is like the the key place where all the elites train. Um, Colorado is, yeah, certainly not inundated with uh, professional athletes anyway, but it's a really active city. I mean, when we go for a run, every single day, even despite the days when it was like minus 10 degrees, there were still people out jogging, people going for walks, people cycling. Um, and they actually clear one of the trails every day as well if with the, from the snow um, for people to cycle to and from work and to just keep fit and active. So it is a really active city and um, yeah, it's just a, a cool place to train. How do you find your altitude? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. Obviously I've been altitude training now for several years, but it doesn't get any any easier. Um, I'd say probably last year and this year, due to the pandemic, I suppose our travel has been completely different to what mm. we would normally do. Um, so we actually spent a lot of time at warm weather over the winter rather than at altitude this year. Um, so my last altitude stint was back in October, early November. So it's quite a long time to you sort of lose all your adaptations then to just come out in, in March, April. But um, yeah, been a little bit of a shock to the system, but it's always nice feeling that hard effort, if you know what I mean, when your lungs are burning, you know that it's it's working. So um, how long does it yeah. take you normally to sort of get used to it? I mean, everyone is obviously individual, but for yeah. me, I'd say the first two weeks I find extraordinarily tough. I just find it really, <laughs> really difficult. Do you train differently? Do you go on like more uh, perceived exertion or yeah. still try and hit the paces and just suffer? No, I'd say my easy runs are all done to heart rate. So yeah. I just don't worry about the, the pace that I'm running. Um, I just accept that the pace will be a lot slower than, than at home. Um, for interval sessions, I do a lot of work obviously on the track. Um, and... I would usually double the recovery. So okay. I might still do the same session. Um, I might still have mile efforts, but I'll double the recovery. I would take at sea level. Um, and again, just slightly adjust the paces. I mean, even if I tried my absolute hardest, I still wouldn't be able to run what I run at sea level anyway. So uh, you just sort of accept that naturally it's going to be a bit tougher. You're a little bit slower. Um, but there is a conversion for every, obviously, every altitude that you do train at. So um, 
but we we don't really pay too much attention to that to be honest i really just in my interval sessions run to effort and just take the added the added recovery i live at altitude and i train at altitude and i ask i'm asking all these questions just to get some <laughs> top tips really but uh i've been out here for like uh five years now and um i don't really notice it so much so much anymore and to, unless i go really high and I literally cross over the about 2,500 now meters. And then I'm like, oh, my God, I'm trying so hard and I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> Uh, have you been for a run yet today? Yeah, an easy run today. I'm definitely not an early morning runner. Um, I love my sleep. I'm definitely more of a night owl. I just naturally, yeah, I suppose I just feel more alert and awake. Um, most of my sessions, I probably wouldn't start till maybe 11, half 11. Okay. Um, I just find that if I get up early morning to try and do a session, I just don't run the same quality. So for me, <laughs> it's more important. I just have, yeah, a couple of hours extra sleep. Yeah. Um, I'm lucky that I am a professional athlete. Do you mean I have 24 hours in the day to train? So there's there's no real need for me to get up at the crack of dawn when I have the rest of the day to, to focus on the other things. So yeah, I'm certainly... Uh, a late morning riser. Now, most of our listeners are from the trail and ultra running um, scene. Could you share a bit about your history so those guys can kind of catch up with you? Yeah, I mean, I obviously came into the sport um, just like everyone does, probably through like primary school and, and high school. Um, the teachers thought that I'd be good at running, so put me into the local cross-country race. And I think it was more to do with probably my surname and just assuming that because I was a McColgan, I was going to be good at running. And I, I just loved it. I did my first cross country, maybe when I was last year of primary school. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't win any medals or anything, but I just, I, I love being able to just run outdoors and be part of it all. And so from there, I joined my local running club, um, which was Dundee Hockle Harriers. I'm still a member there today. And I just did all events. I did, I actually started off in javelin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did javelin, I did high jump, um, sprint hurdles. Yeah. Just as a kid, Jim and I just enjoyed athletics. I loved it all. Um, it wasn't really until probably my first or second year at high school that I was like, actually, I really enjoy running. Like I yeah. enjoyed the running aspect of it. And um, at the time, 800 meters was like the long, that was long distance. Like that was the longest distance. <laughs> I remember that. Two laps was like. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I said, I remember saying to my mom, look, I want to do the long distance running. And she said, look, if you stay at the club for whatever it was, X amount of months, then I'll come down and um, I'll start coaching you. And it just went from there. And I mean, my mom's still my coach to this day. Um, and of course, over the years, the distances has just gradually ramped yeah. up from 800 to 1500. And then when I was around 17, I think I did my first ever 3000 meters. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, this is a marathon. Like I'm never, my mom always said to me, one day you'll run a 5k and a 10k. Yeah. And eventually you'll run a marathon. And I used to just think, oh my God, she's crazy. Like I'm never, <laughs> ever doing that. Um, and then I ran my first 5k, loved it. And then I remember saying the same thing, like, I'll never do a 10K, I'll never do it. And then, yeah, here I am now um, as, a, as a 10K runner. Um, I still haven't done a marathon quite yet. It's definitely on my future plans in the near yeah. future. Um, obviously, with the Olympics being postponed, we've had to, like, delay things another, another year. So this year, the main priority is qualifying for the 10,000 metres uh, in Tokyo in the Olympic yeah. Games. After that, I'd like to try and um, do my first ever half marathon this year, hopefully. Yeah. Um, I've had about four cancellations for a half marathon yes. all of last year and this year. So I'm desperate to just do one just to experience it, to be honest. Have you got um, one penciled in a half marathon? No, not quite yet. Um, a lot of things have been, again, just so many cancellations. Um, it's difficult to, to know yeah, what, what, what one will definitely go ahead and what yeah. one won't. Um, I'd love to do something, sort of the historic races, like a, a Great North Run, something like that. I'd love to be, yeah. uh, I'd love to do that. So that's definitely... You can stay at crossed. Gary's. Can't, can't, can't <laughs> yeah, Gary. yeah, I've got a spare room, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so fingers crossed, if that goes ahead, I'd, I'd love to do um, Great North Half is definitely sort of cool. up there as one of my like bucket list races for sure. 
And we, you know, we normally ask our guests if they had any kind of sporty influences as they grew up. Now we, we all know you did, but what was that like being part of a, an athletic family? Yeah, I mean, I think people expect me to have been like forced into it and just coerced into running because both my parents did. But my my mum and dad often like kept me away from it all. Like I don't ever remember. I never remember seeing my mum race or watching any of her competitions. The only reason I have seen them is on is because journalists, um, when I was around maybe 15, I remember they like sat me down and made me watch my mum on YouTube. And that was probably the first time I'd ever really watched yeah. my mum compete, to be honest. She'd always shied away from it all and wanted me to, to run because I wanted to do it rather than feel forced into it. And she never had her like Olympic medal in the house or anything. It was always like, I think it was in her sock drawer because she was angry, like she hadn't won gold. So like her silver Olympic medal was just yeah. like in the, the sock drawer. And <laughs> she never had like accolades around the house, anything like that. So when I was growing up, it was just, I was aware my mom and dad were runners, but I was sort of assumed that everyone's parents sort of did that. Do you know, I was just very naive. I didn't realize the difference between obviously someone going for a run every day, but someone yeah. being like a world champion is, is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It wasn't really until I got into the sport myself as a teenager that I started to have a bit more of awareness of like, okay, this is it's difficult to become like a school champion or a county yeah. champion to become a world champion is, is really extraordinary. Yeah. So it took, yeah, I was probably very naive to it all. Um, but in a way, I'm glad my parents did that because I definitely feel like I went into the sport for the right reasons. And that's probably why I've still continued to enjoy it and love it. Because yeah. I never felt, I never felt pressured. They didn't ever pressure me into it. And I never really even felt the comparisons, to be honest, as a kid until maybe I became an adult and people started, when I naturally started doing the 5K, the 10K, yeah. and of course people start making uh, comparisons between me and my mum. But initially I started off in the, the steeplechase, which was an event my mum had never done. Yeah. So maybe that helped me a little bit in the fact that the start of my career, there was no, not really any comparison because I was nowhere near competing at the level my mum was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's a huge part of my team even now. My mom and my dad are huge supporters of me and yeah. um, my mom more so obviously is my coach. Um, so yeah, I certainly wouldn't be where I am today without, without either of them. How does that um, relationship work? Because I think firstly, that's huge testimony to your parents. I've got three small children. So I was just listening going, oh my, I would love it if my, if my children grow up talking so highly of their parents like, like you've just done there. Um, how does that relationship with your mum work now as her coaching? Has there been ups and downs? Because I know now, but being a mum, like even telling my kids to put their shoes away, because sometimes it causes <laughs> like, oh my God, it's going to be God, I'll be ruining my life. Yeah. How has that relationship, it must have developed over the time. Um, it must have had its highs and lows. And can you tell us a little bit about how that relationship works? Because obviously she's not with you now. No, no, no. Um, yeah, so she's, I suppose it was far more difficult as a, as a kid, just because it's difficult to perhaps differentiate between mum and coach. So little arguments, yeah, that you may have about whatever it is, doing the laundry or cleaning your room, then obviously spill over to training. But my mum was very good at being able to just treat me like everyone else in the group. Like if you were new and you came down to the, the Hockle Harriers and you joined in our group, I don't think you would know that me and my mum were mother and daughter. Do you mean I was just another kid in the group and I get treated like everyone else? And I think that's why it worked really well. We had a really good sociable group and I was part of that sort of, we we're a little family essentially, all the, yeah. the people that we trained with. And my mum was the coach and that was it. And there was no preferential treatment or anything like that. And it just, it seemed to fit really well. Um, but yeah, it was difficult. I think the younger you are, because it is your mum at the end of the day. So you're, you're not escaping in either sense. Do you know I mean, when you're at training, your mum's there. When you're at home, your mum's there. Yeah. Um, but again, my mum always allowed me, she would always take a step back. And even if she wasn't too happy with, for example, when I started uh, a university, I was going out a lot. I was partying a lot. I was drinking all the time, just doing what all students do and having a, a normal life. Um, she never once stepped in and said, 
you shouldn't be doing this or she I could sort of sense that she maybe wasn't too happy with it but she never ever once would would step in and say anything about it because she always took a step back and just allowed me to make my own decisions and she always said as well that if I came back into the sport then at least again I would be doing it for the right reasons and I think that was the 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 best thing she again she probably could have done because I decided sort of just towards the end of university, I was like, actually, I want to really make a, a proper go of this. I want to see if I can become a, a professional athlete because to that point, I was just, yeah, I was enjoying running. It was a hobby, really. That's all it was to me. But certainly something changed towards the end of my university days. I just thought, actually, I want this to go from a hobby to, to a career if I can. Um, so I'd say definitely as an adult, the relationship's been far easier because once I went to university, we obviously weren't in the same household anymore. Um, so it, it's easier. And I suppose as an adult as well, you have a greater appreciation of what that individual is doing for you. And you know I mean, I, I now can see everything that her and my dad did. Do you know what I mean? Driving me up and down the country to and from competitions, yeah. giving up every weekend they have, do you know what I mean? To go to the north of Scotland and the freezing cold <laughs> to stand at the side and cheer me on. Yeah. Just the, the opportunities, do you know what I mean? That my parents gave me to allow me to, to continue in the sport. They really did give me everything I could to have uh, given athletics a chance. And so certainly now as an adult, yeah, I have a, a huge appreciation of that. And me and my mum actually work remotely. Um, she moved to uh, Qatar about, I don't know, seven years ago now. I can't even remember how many years ago she moved. Um, so, and obviously I travel a lot with my my partner, Michael, and everything we do now coaching-wise is just is remote coaching, online coaching. But I feel like because we've got such a good uh communication between us I mean no one knows me any better than my own mum so it's very easy for us to communicate and just continue the coaching partnership even though we're on completely different continents of the world so what does a normal sort of typical day look for you look like for you does she sort of set you the week in advance or do you sort of have like daily contact do you know what's coming up she'll send over like maybe a two week or a four week depending on I suppose uh, at the moment it's been very difficult. It's obviously not been uh, the sort of longer term plans that we normally Mm. would have. Um, We never make anything too far in advance because in athletics, I mean, things change you. You can get sick, you get injured, you have to adapt and races come up. You have to adapt and, and be flexible. But I usually have a general month outline of what we sort of want to try and get out of that month. Um, I, I'm the type of athlete that if it's there, I'll do it. So my mum doesn't have to worry about me missing something or skipping part of the programme. Like she knows that I'm very driven and I'll make sure that everything that's down, I will do. Um, It can sometimes be a little bit detrimental. I think in the past it has been because without a coach there to stop you from Mm -hmm. making those sort of uh, uh, over pushing (laughs) in sessions and things like that, I'm really lucky now that... I have my my boyfriend Michael is really good at being able to scale back a little bit. If I'm yeah. sick or I'm carrying a niggle, I'll just keep push, 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 push. That's just the way I'm sort of uh, internally <laughs> of synced up. I just can't get out of that. That's just my natural way of. I always think I need to do more and I need to push harder. And yeah. whereas he's really good at being able to say, "Look, I'm here with you every single day. I know when he knows when I'm tired. He knows if I don't look quite right, and it's." I suppose I've got my mum obviously doing the overall programme and, and setting the main bulk of the sessions, but yeah. my boyfriend is the one on the ground with me. We're, 20, we're together 24-7 and he is the one making maybe the smaller decisions day to day of actually, I think we need to call it a day here because you're dead. <laughs> There's no point in trying <laughs> to run. Um, so it's it's nice to have the balance of both things. Um, Communication wise, me and my mum chat every day. So on WhatsApp, as soon as I've done my run, like this morning, I'll send her over. I did a, a, a long run, um, a long run for me anyway, which is 16 miles. That's definitely far enough. Um, so I'll text her afterwards to say 16 miles felt good. Um, I don't know. I might say something if the weather was bad or yeah. what pace I ran, any niggles or anything that cropped up. Just a general, I suppose, outline of how the run went same yeah. thing with interval sessions as soon as i finish the session i'll text her over 
I did key reps. These were my splits. This is the recovery we took just so that she can keep a, a note of it as well. Um, and then, yeah, that's how, how we've been working now for the last yeah, several years. And I read somewhere, I had a stress fracture uh, a couple of years ago and I took to aqua jogging and you were one of my inspirations of going up and down the pool with my <laughs> with my belt on. And I read somewhere that you don't run twice a day anymore because your body can't um, handle that. Is that is that still true or now? Could you, can you, if you do a session in the morning, do you do a recovery session in the afternoon or no again because of the injuries i've had i mean i've got um seven screws and a metal plate in my left foot and they let from... you into america they must have been like <laughs> <laughs> and that's from two yeah two previous surgeries so to be honest it started off initially i had to stop double running because of the pain i couldn't mm. i could almost i could run in the morning and sort of run through the pain and then the evening i just couldn't it just wasn't feasible yeah so this was in 2016 after I just came back from surgery and I had the Olympic Games coming up. So we sort of made the decision of let's just run once a day if you can and just cross train in the evenings. And in my first race of the season, after only so many months of that, I ran, I think it was 15.09 for a 5K and it was a huge PB. Um, it was an Olympic qualifying time and I just couldn't believe it. Like I'd gone from being someone that felt like I needed to run 70 80 miles a week um double daying i felt like that was what i needed to do to run yeah. fast and then to really scale that down and only be running 40 mile a week but with some cross training on top and run 30 odd seconds faster than i ever had i suppose it just opened my eyes a little bit that actually i'm clearly an athlete that needs more quality over quantity so if i really focus on my interval sessions two days a week and i get those track times down to where they need to be then Everything else, to be honest, is supplementary. And I can obviously do that in the pool or on the cross trainer or on the bike. Yeah. Um, so it's just been a format that we've just we've followed. And obviously over the years, I have increased my mileage. Um, I was probably only running, yeah, 30, 35 initially. And now we're trying to move that up towards 65, 70, if I yeah. can. Um, we started just, I think it was the last, halfway through last year, I started increasing um, just one day a week, trying a double run in the evening. So just going for like a three mile run, uh, actually on the treadmill as well. I felt like it was a little bit less impact yeah. going outside. Obviously at some point I'm going to move up to the marathon and I can't continue running just 50 miles a week once a day. I do feel like I need to have that recovery element and the impacting because the marathon is, is a bit of a beast and yeah. To get around 26.2 miles, I know that I need to have that impact in, in the legs and the leg strength. So it is something we're trying to, to think, how do we build this up? But I definitely won't be an athlete who will be training twice a day every day. It's just not something, or running, sorry, twice a day every day. It's just not something that will be part of my program. I think the focus, even when I move up in distance, will always be on the, the quality side of things. We're talking about marathons, or did you watch, have you caught up with the trials today? Yeah, we literally just watched that. So um, it was, yeah, incredible. My boyfriend actually stayed up till half four this morning to watch it. <laughs> I was so desperate to do it, but he wouldn't let me do it because he said it would just mess up. Uh, my. As soon as I stay up one night, that'll be me then for like the next yeah. month. I'll be get that. Oh, then. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he wouldn't allow me to stay up, but he sat and watched it. Um, so we wa I literally just finished watching it there before I came onto the call. Um, yeah, it's incredible to see Tomo. I mean, obviously I've known Tomo oh, for, wow, yes. oh. for a while and I've been on teams with him in, in Rio. Um, so yeah, it's pretty incredible to see him make another Olympic games at the age of 39 is, yeah. is pretty inspirational. And, He's had his injury um, struggles too, hasn't he? Yeah, it's very, it's so well-deserved. Do you know I mean, I know he's had his up and downs, his injury problems, um, so I know that he trains so hard as well. So like yeah. for someone, it's always been obviously capable of doing it, but it's just putting it together at the right time and at the right place. Um, so yeah, it was pretty, pretty incredible to see that happen uh, this morning. And kudos to his wife too, who had the baby on Monday. And Yeah, uh, I mean, oh, yeah, wow, that, that must have been, been yeah. emotional. Road. I know. Okay. Let's see when he finished, they was like, oh, and now I can cry. It must be an amazing, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing week for their family. So um, yeah, hats off to him and it'll be great to see him, see what he can do out in Tokyo. You were pacing at the 2020 kind of, 
um, the elite event. How was that for you? You know, you, from a observer, you looked like you had a great time. Yeah, it was obviously very last minute. I had only found out, um, I got the phone call on the Friday to pace the marathon on the Sunday. So me and Michael had been looking at, I was on my, like on my end of season break. So we'd been looking at going to um, Italy and holiday because the UK had just created a travel corridor with Italy. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, I want some downtime. Like it's been a bit of a strange year. Um, so we were up all night, Thursday night, trying to book a holiday. And we were oh, like, he, oh, he let you stay up to book a holiday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were like, oh, we'll do it Friday morning. Like, I can't be bothered just now. We'll get it sorted Friday morning. We'll leave Saturday. And um, yeah, I got a call Friday morning asking would I pace the London Marathon. And it's been something I'd been asking to do for a couple of months. I'd said like, I'd love to be part of just the experience of it all. Cause I've never been a part of a major event like that. Like obviously yeah. I've done track races and um, I've done the Great South Run, but this was, was a marathon. To be honest, for me, it was just getting a feel of what that was like. Getting up in the morning is going to be a real killer for me. I'm not used to it. So I wanted to just see like, yeah, how do marathoners prepare? Like, what do they do? Yeah. Um, so it was a really cool experience. Obviously it was very different with COVID restrictions, but yeah, my aim was, they had asked me to run to nine miles or just over nine miles if I could. Um, I was confident I could get to sort of 10 maybe halfway yeah um but yeah i just felt really really comfortable running at that pace i was really surprised and again i think that's probably given me a bit of an insight into when i do move up to the marathon that i don't need to be like someone who's my mom like my mom who was running 120 to i don't know god knows 140 miles a week yeah. like i don't think that's ever going to be the athlete that i am but yeah i ended up running just over 17 miles yeah you kept going <laughs> at um 225 marathon pace so I was I was really happy with that I mean I'd had a bit of a, a rubbish season on the track just been really tired fatigued and yeah. so we'd really backed off and I'd only been running maybe I don't know 30 mile a week if that because we just had some tried to take some time back yeah and um my longest run was probably eight miles at that point so to go and run 17 <laughs> was a, a bit of a shock Wow. Um, but yeah, I loved it. The whole experience was really cool. And to be honest, we didn't really know how far we were running because our GPS watches were obviously all a little oh, bit yeah. out going yeah. around in a, in a circle and being yeah. so many of us as well. Um, and the signs were in kilometers and miles. So every oh. lap, you had no idea where you That's were. Too much so maths. I just, yeah, I was just, I have a math degree as well. So that was even more. I was more just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, I genuinely couldn't work out how far we'd we'd ran i knew my watch was obviously only slightly out so i was sort of just yeah. going by my watch and i just waited until the race organizer had told me like get off now <laughs> like you've, yeah. ran, <laughs> you've ran far too much <laughs> um, so yeah it was a really cool experience um i definitely feel i could have had another couple of miles maybe made it to i don't know 19 20 miles which is exciting i think to make that final six miles would take a hell of a lot more training um but yeah it was cool to know that at least i could get to to 20 um feeling like that and was that just dialogue amongst the, the group just you know do you want to stay in for another couple of kilometers or you just kept going yeah so there was meant to be myself and um one of the kenyan athletes and she was meant to be pacing to i was to nine or ten miles and she was meant to be going to i think 30k but after maybe I can't even remember now, to be honest. I remember thinking around seven or eight miles that I wasn't sure. I felt I could feel her falling off the pace. Um, and then at halfway, I turned around and she was she was gone. So okay. I almost felt like a responsibility for the athletes that we were in our little group because they'd been told that I would be going to 10 miles and there would be another pacer to 30K. So it was almost like a uh, an added responsibility. I felt like guilty of that. Just I could peel off and this person has to go and just run the whole way on their own. Yeah. And one of the American girls, Molly Seidel was running so well. And um, she was on for a big PB. So I said to her, look, I'm going to try and go as far as I can. I have no idea when that might be. <laughs> I might not make it much further, but I said, I feel okay. So I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And yeah. she was so lovely. Like she was like, Oh, you're amazing. You're a rock star. Thank Aww. you so much. Brilliant. It just really was encouraging, like feeling like you're helping someone else doing you know I mean? rather than in running. It's always about you and how fast you run and your PBs and your yeah. goals. Yeah. So to feel like you were helping someone else achieve theirs was, it was really cool. 
Um, so yeah, I went to just after, I think it was just after 17 miles I peeled off and, um, she was lovely. Like she was speaking the whole way through thanking me, like every lap she was like saying, thank you. And Amazing. Um, yeah, it was really cool. And afterwards she obviously ran a big PB. She ran 225 and afterwards she came up and gave me a massive hug. Cool. Um, and she just, yeah, just thanked me for helping her out. Um, so it was really cool. It's just nice to be part of something a bit different. I just know at some point when I go to the marathon, I know there'll be pacers and there'll be people that'll, that'll help me out. So yeah. Um, yeah, it was cool to, to give back a little bit. And I loved the whole experience. Um, the next three days I couldn't walk. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm definitely not prepared for, uh, the impact of what that takes through your legs. So that's definitely something that, yeah, of course, in the next couple of years, I really need to build up, as we said earlier with the mileage, I mean, being able to impact and load for that length of time, yeah. my body wasn't used to it. I could do it. But afterwards was was a complete write off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And is that like you know, say a couple of years? There? Is that what you're kind of looking at for, for, for potentially having to go to the marathon? Yeah. So the aim was actually to do a marathon this year. Um. So obviously to have Tokyo last year and then into a marathon this year. But yeah, unfortunately due to COVID that just hasn't happened. And the goal was always to do Tokyo a half a marathon, and yeah. then that would be me on the roads. And of course I'll still. I'd still love to do 10 Ks. I think it's still important as a marathoner that you you do have 10 Ks within the program, but the aim really was to move up to the roads and just try something yeah. something different. Um, I feel like that's the, the sort of part of my career now that I'm excited by. It's like a new challenge. It's something different. I've spent a lot of years on the track, so it felt like the natural progression. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, everything's been sort of postponed a year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the aim right now is obviously just Tokyo, all on track still. Looking towards, yeah, half marathon, potentially end of this year, and then building towards the marathon after that. And you say about Tokyo, um, so you have the qualifying time, but when do you find out if you are going or not? Yeah, everything's a little bit up in the air. Like usually you have to have a qualifying time and then you come top two in your um, British Championship trial. The trial was originally at the Highgate 10,000, the night of yeah. 10,000s. Um, oh, that, yeah. that got cancelled and British Athletics just informed us, I think it was last week, that they've now made a new trial in Birmingham, uh, Birmingham University. Um, but we still aren't quite sure if it's is it definitely 100% going ahead? You know, yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's meant to be combined with the, the European Cup, which I think will be very difficult with the restrictions across Europe at the moment. I can't see how athletes are going to get into the country without quarantining. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of tests that came back positive from the recent European indoor champs as well. So oh my goodness, okay. I'm not sure if... I really don't know what's what's happening, to be honest. So my main goal really was just to... Make sure I have the qualifying time. Yeah. Um, that's the the first and foremost. And then if the trials goes ahead, then top two at the trials will guarantee you a, a spot on the plane to Tokyo. Yeah. Um, they always have a, a third discretionary spot for people who are injured or ill or okay. perhaps can't make it to the race due to these travel restrictions. It's all a little bit crazy at the moment. So, yeah. um yeah, the main goal is to to try and qualify for the team over the the ten. I'd love to have a pop at the five k as well. Um, yeah, I think they both events complement each other. So yeah, that's the main main goals for this year, this this summer. And your second writing thing, and your second fastest Scottish lady. Yeah, behind my mum. So yeah. my mum's ran fifty seven, and I've run uh, thirty fifty eight. So I was absolutely gutted to just miss her her time. Um, I had it. Obviously, in the back of my mind, that was the main goal was to try and yeah. break my mom's PB. But yeah, I can't. I can't be too greedy. I had a whole. Did she send you there. like a WhatsApp emoji going? <laughs> no, I was. Do you know what? My mom's like always said to me that I've been capable of breaking her times, and I've never believed it because I always saw those times of just being far beyond what I think I I was capable of doing. I broke the her. 5k her 3k and her 1500 times in the last couple of years but yeah i always felt like the 10k was was just tough like running sub 31 minutes was just yeah. a, a big goal um a big target to try and aim for and two years ago i ran 31 16 and i that was the first time i thought actually 
I think I can do this. Do you know what I think I can actually break my mom's record? And for years, she's told me that I've been capable of doing it. Um, so for her, she was actually a little bit disappointed because she's seen the training that I was doing leading up to that race. Um, we were really actually aiming for my first half marathon was meant to be over in uh, Rack, which is in the UAE. Yeah. And that got cancelled the week before it. So she was a bit gutted because she felt like, obviously I was gutted as well. We'd been training for four months in the lead up to that and things would be going super well. And then last minute, I flew over to America to jump into this 10K race because we felt like if the half wasn't going to happen, then at least let's put this training into something. Yeah. Um, so she actually felt I was capable of running sort of 30, 40 in the low, somewhere around there. Um, so she was a little bit disappointed that I'd ran 30, 58. And so was I, yeah. to be honest, because again, I felt capable of going a bit faster, but yeah, it was very last minute. It was a lot of travel, all things considered. I was just, I was over the moon to just even break yeah. 31 minutes. At least that's the first sort yeah, of big yeah. target. You must've um, been on the plane for my goodness me, what 15 hours or something. It must've been a huge flight. Uh, it was, I think it was 16 or 17 hours, oh. 16 oh and a half hours. <laughs> I know. And then a 12 hour time difference as well. So oh. it was a lot of, I'd actually picked up an ear infection as well two weeks before that. And I dropped out of every session I'd done. So to be honest, we flew over there with everyone not really sure how this was going to go. My boyfriend was sort of expecting me to, to not make it around the 25 laps. Yeah. My mum wasn't too sure. I mean, we were all a bit like on edge, but I knew that the training had been banked. Do you know what I mean? It was somewhere, yeah. <laughs> somewhere in the body. <laughs> but to be honest, probably the, the fact that I had been dropping out of sessions, I had a little bit more rest and recovery going into it. Um, that I felt just really fully recovered for that race and, and felt really good during it. So it's given me a lot of confidence, I think, over the, the 10. Um, of course, I'd love to try and break my mum's Scottish record by the end of the year, but it's just race opportunities are very limited yeah. in the five and 10 K anyway, yeah. and probably even more so now with uh, coronavirus. Well, it's super, it's going to be super exciting to see what you can do with a little bit more rest and <laughs> uh, not a 16 hour flight. Um, we, I was wondering, do you ever do much running on the trails? You've talked, we've talked about track and these heinous lactic acid sessions that you do, but, uh, Gary and I are, are trail runners. So I, I haven't set foot on a track for, since I was at university, I don't think we're, we're on the trails. So do you, when you go for your sort of easy runs, do you look to run on the trail? Is that something that you find um, it sort of enthuses you to run as change from the track? Um, yeah, so I, I only have um, two interval sessions a week that are on the track and everything else is on trails. Um, I don't, I don't really run on road at all, to be honest. When I'm at home in the UK, I never run on the road. Um, I don't do intervals on it. I don't do easy runs or anything on it. It's just, I've got a really nice trail um, next to the house that in Manchester where my boyfriend lives that um, it's just like a woodland trail that I run on, but I'd say it's, I'm very specific with what trails I do run on. <laughs> I was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> my trails are very, very, very different to your trails. Smooth. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's always very clean trails. Uh, to be honest, the same thing when we're here in Colorado, when we're in, uh, we were in California just two weeks ago, I always managed to scout out like nice trails. Um, yes. I feel like it's like a some sort of gift that I have on Google <laughs> Maps. I can just, as I go on Google Maps and I find the best trails in the area. Um, but yeah, I prefer to run on flat trails if I can. Obviously, it's important for me to sort of maintain good turnover. Yeah. Um, because of the injuries I've had, I avoid rocky trails. I've obviously broke my ankle and my foot. Yeah. Um, with seven screws in there, I have to be so cautious of where I run. So yeah. I actually don't run on grass for that reason either. I just always run on flat sort of good gravel, compact trails if I can. Um, but I do definitely feel like it's helped reduce injuries. As a kid, I mean, I would just be running on roads or at yeah. university, I would just go and run on the roads all the time. But certainly once I turned uh, professional, I've always been offloading on the trails. And I definitely think it it helps just reduce the impact, certainly yeah. less injuries than I've had in the past. Um, and I just find it more interesting than on the roads. Like I just don't, I find the roads just a little bit boring. I suppose it's probably with traffic and things like that. I mean, it's nice to just be off on a, on a nice trail and just yeah. switch off a little bit. 
but yeah, it's certain it's probably not the the single track that that you guys are used to running on. <laughs> I don't think you're going to be coming on a training camp to Moors in the <laughs> island. I'd have to prepare something, get something made for you. I love the idea of those. I keep hearing them on other podcasts. These manicured trails they have in America. I just think that would be brilliant just to have all the scenery, but without the the trip hazards that we have in on the fells over here. Yeah, I mean, America is they have a lot of. Um, a lot of cycle paths. So a lot of tar- there is tarmac paths across the whole country, like connecting everywhere. So if you are a marathon runner, it's it's great. Yeah. You're yeah. Miles and miles. But sometimes they do have like a little bit of almost dirt at the side. And that's that's where I am. So my boyfriend yeah. cycles along and then I'm on just on this <laughs> tiny little section of dirt at the side. Look at me but, off road. Um, it's boring. Yeah. <laughs> Trail runner. <laughs> But it, is, it has reduced injuries, so I'd say yeah, it's for me it's the safest, safest way to stay injury free. You talked a bit earlier about your long run being um, sixteen miles. What is the um, the furthest that you've that you've ever run in sort of one so sitting? Before um, before this year, the longest I'd ever run was fifteen miles, um, but just easy, so like easy pace. Um, controlled longest race I'd ever done was the great South run 10 mile. Um, so then when I went to London and I paced to 17, that was the longest run I'd ever done in my life. So oh, to run amazing like, 225 amazing. pace for 17 miles, I was really happy. Yeah. With that. Oh, we, I mean, it was way faster than I would do a, an easy run. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I surprised myself. I didn't believe I was, my body could do that to be honest <laughs> but it was a shock as I said the next three days I didn't walk so I definitely wasn't conditioned or you were going on holiday it was fine yeah exactly yeah. exactly so um yeah so my longest run um 15 to 16 miles is is what I'm doing at the moment um before even probably before last year the longest run was 10 to 12 so even that's been a quite a big step up for me um people used to laugh when I said my my long run was 10 miles i used to hate it on training i'm never and- laughing at anything you say <laughs> everything you say i'm like so wise yes, yes. um so yeah it's, it's i feel like at least 16 is a that's a, a decent amount yeah. of miles to feel like at least i'm i'm sort of an endurance runner now i'm getting there <laughs> we race over like 50 miles 100 miles would you ever be tempted to try that sort of distance no i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> can't argue um, with that <laughs> You know, it, it's different. Like, I don't. I'd say long runs for me are probably the least enjoyable part of my training. No like, way! Just, yeah, oh, that's like, the only thing you've said that's disappointed me. We yeah, can't be best friends. Not, for me, like I, I've always loved the intervals. Like, I love pushing myself and feeling like that. I like the speed side of it. I say speed. It's speed for me anyway. But yeah. I feel like it's that side of the thing I enjoy. Like, I feel I could. I'd quite happily do a track session every day if I could. For me, it's the long, like long runs. I'm a bit, yeah, I don't know. I just you need to run past a bakery run. or a coffee shop or something. <laughs> yeah. That's what I it's do. Definitely, it's definitely evolved though, because I used to, I used to properly hate them. Like I used to not enjoy it at all. And now actually, I mean, 16 miles to be honest, actually clipped by a lot quicker than that would do yeah. if it was a couple of years ago. So I am gradually becoming to enjoy them a lot more. And, um, I, yeah, who knows? I mean, the marathon is obviously the first step uh, to doing that longer distance. Um, but yeah, I'm sure at some point I'll get roped into doing a, a, an ultra. Um, we actually have a few runners that we coach online that do ultras and they rave about it. I mean, they put in so much effort and work towards yeah. it. So I know the training it takes to get to that distance. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think not not for a long time yet. <laughs> But never say no, never say never. Never say never. I'm just yeah. curious, have you got any um, like a recovery procedures that you go through? You know, say after you did the, the pacing event at London Marathon. Yeah, I mean, very simple stuff. I mean, I obviously have um, like a protein shake with milk. Um, it's usually after, pretty much as soon as I've done any hard efforts, I'll have that yeah. straight away. I find it difficult sometimes if I'm out somewhere I don't like the fact it might take 30 minutes to get back and then make yeah. your lunch. And then, so I find that just getting that into me as quick as I can is, is the best way to start the recovery process. And then I can go home and have my lunch and start, keep recovering. Yeah. Um, sleep is definitely a huge one for me. I, if I, I'm quite a light sleeper. So if I have disrupted sleep, 
it just wipes out my my training sessions can really plummet so okay. i do have to make sure that in the evenings small things like i'm coming off my phone um yeah. for a couple hours i'm maybe stretching before bed just to have like a bit of a downtime before i go to sleep otherwise i'll be up all night long um <laughs> I have again after training I have my bag is like full of snacks. Um so for me food and recovery is probably the biggest one. Yeah. Um obviously I know this is a cheer charge podcast but I'm going to plug them on here anyway <laughs> but um even having cheer charge bars in my bag um the protein ones for afterwards I like yeah. just again it's quick it's easy it's simple to get in they taste nice. Um I'd say before yeah, that's mainly afterwards, to be honest. I like I like having those um, yeah. in my bag for recovery. Ice baths is another one. Oh, okay. Um, I usually only use these in summer peak season. Um, so if I have, yeah, maybe, I don't know, a World Champs or Olympics coming up, I'll start to use ice baths a little bit more within my recovery from um, hard intervals. I'll usually have an ice bath 10 15 minutes yeah um again i know people some people hate them some people say they don't work every yeah. time i ever post about it on social media i always get people saying <laughs> they don't work the science is is rubbish but i i find it work like i personally feel it oh, yeah. to, to my legs so i'm going to continue doing something that i feel works yeah. for me um, so everyone has their, yeah, their different little things that they do for recovery, but those would be the key things for me would be sleep, um, good nutrition straight afterwards. So some sort of, yeah, protein shake with milk, a snack, chia charge, things like that. Um, and ice baths for me are the three. And do you have any pre-race superstitions? No, nothing actually. I'm no. trying to think <laughs> I used to, as a kid, I well, I say a kid when I first raced in my first ever diamond league. Um, I remember looking around and seeing none of the girls had socks on with their spikes because obviously we did the steeplechase, they didn't want their socks to get wet. I assume it weighs you down. Yeah. So I took my socks off for the first time. I always wore socks and then took my socks off in this diamond league. Um, and I broke my foot with 600 meters to go. Oh. I snapped my navicular bone. Now this probably has absolutely nothing to do with wearing socks, like probably completely irrelevant. But since then, I've always wore socks and always spikes. And socks. I know some people don't, some people still don't wear socks with their spikes. But for me, that's like, that's the only thing I make sure I have on all times. <laughs> I like to have like a, a thin pair. I've got like ASIC socks that are really thin. And those are the ones I, I race in. So that's oh. the only, yeah, maybe slight superstition I have. I just like having, uh, I'm very... Uh, much into routine as well I like having I write down my race routine so what time I wake up in the morning what time I have my morning porridge um what time I will do my stretching all like minute by minute right up until the race time um yeah. I have the exact time I take my chia charge bar <laughs> like I have honestly I have everything you're on such the, a pro yeah I, I have everything scheduled to like the minute by yeah. minute it's just Again, I don't know if that's a superstition, but like, I feel like I need to, that's my race day. Like I don't yeah. do it for training. I'm not like a stickler for times at training. I can yeah. rock up the track any time of day, but for racing, it's like, it is really minute by minute. And I suppose yeah. we have to, because if you're a minute late, then you're not racing. Can you, could you tell us your favorite track session that you do? Oh, and then I'm going to try it. <laughs> oh my God. Maybe something, uh, I don't know. I like the quicker, I like quicker reps. I like the feeling of cutting down distance and the speed increasing. So maybe something like, I only, I very rarely do this to be honest, but I only do it in the summer, maybe just before racing some like really faster, uh, shorter events. Something like K8642. Um, so 1,000 meters, 800, 600, 400, 200, and yeah. taking like a long recovery in between it all. Gary's uh, like, this is next session. So yes. <laughs> Sometimes I'll do like a 2K on the front of that. So 2K, K8642, but just the yeah. cutting down, I just really like that feeling of you're getting faster. Like it's a bit of a, 
a mental boost, even though you're reducing obviously the the distance you're running, you yeah. still get a, a boost feeling like you're you're improving and running faster. You and Gary were running 400 meter reps on the same day the other night, and you posted for people to guess what time. And he really wants to know, but I think he's too shy to ask. Yeah, but you were like. <laughs> What time six, you were running with? 6,000, or well, just under 6,000 feet of elevation or something, was it? Yeah, and you... Yeah, kind of... so it's a little bit a little bit tricky here. My mom gave me an extra 10 seconds recovery here, which I don't think is the equivalent <laughs> She's of, so generous. Uh, oh, so I had a minute 10 recovery. Oh, so wow. So 10 seconds more than I normally have at home. <laughs> um, but I had 20 reps, and they were in anywhere from, yeah, 68 to 69s usually. Oh. Um, Last rep, I usually cut down a little bit. At sea level, they'd be, yeah, a couple of, maybe a second or so faster than that. Yeah. I find over a 400, you can, you're not far off what you would run at sea level. You're not too much slower here, maybe a yeah. second or so. The longer the rep goes, if it's a mile rep, if it's a two, if it's a two mile rep, you can yeah. take a lot more time off. Um, 400s, I can, yeah, just about get away with at altitude. Very good, very good. Well, that's my, that, that was one of my questions. I'll tell you, what, mine was about just under 90 seconds for my 400, but 127s, but then I had 30 seconds, so. 30 seconds is not, yeah, that's very, very tough. You're <laughs> very, so it's not, pretty much similar. Not stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I already did 10. I think it was 10 I did, something like that. I've got one more question, actually, if that's okay. What was the last kind of Netflix or something series like that that you, you binged on, binge watched? <laughs> we have just watched um, Married at First Sight Australia <laughs> on so good. Channel 4. So good. I think we, we have one more episode to watch, which means it'll be 41 hours or something of 41, our life. I, it's 42 <laughs> hours long. 42 I'm, hours, yeah. Long. It's, yeah, my boyfriend... I watched Michael, every episode. Too happy about it. <laughs> But it's so good. Did you manage not to Google what happened to them? Well, I was, yeah, that's what I do all the time and I ruin it. So Michael was like, literally anytime I took my, pick my phone up to go and Google it, he's like, why would I spend yeah. 40 plus hours of my life for you to then tell me <laughs> the final thing? Like, just yeah. wait, be patient. Um, so actually it's the first time ever, like ever, that I haven't ruined a document, like a, a sort of TV series like this, because I always ruin it. But um, yeah, one more hour to go of our lives. It was gripping, we wasn't it? Why was it so gripping? Do you think it's because we're so um, deprived of anything being in lockdown for so long that we found yeah, that? Yeah, nice. I think it's probably to do with that. I think, I mean, my life in general is pretty much like lockdown. Like we don't do much anyway. We don't go out. Um, yeah, I very rarely get to see my family, my friends. So that, this is probably my everyday life, just binging on <laughs> documentaries and reality, rubbish reality TV. But it's the first time I've managed to persuade Michael to watch it with me. Usually, is he sold, I, is he sold on them? Uh, no, I don't think he's too happy about <laughs> 40 hours he won't get back. Um, That's but a lot was, of hours. It was, a, it, it was addictive to watch. And usually I just sit and watch them on like the cross trainer in the evenings. But yeah. this is the first time we've actually dedicated hours of our day towards it. Um, I'm not sure we'd do it again. <laughs> if I could go back, I probably would. Um, but it reminded me of um, Game of Thrones. I did it last, was it last summer? I just battered through Game of Thrones because I was actually oh. on my own on a, on a training camp. And I was watching like eight hours a day. Like I would run in the morning I'd have my breakfast, my lunch, it would be on. I'd be stretching, it would be on. Yeah. Be tea in the evening, it would just be on. Like, I was just battering through them like no tomorrow. I'm with you so, with the uh, Game of Thrones. We tried to watch it. I, we, we put it on. Um, I've already watched it, but then we we're going to re-watch it with the children. And about half an hour in, it was severely inappropriate. So we Yeah, I was going to say, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> it wasn't. It was like, oh, my goodness, turn this off. You'd forgotten. You'd forgotten. <laughs> Yeah. You have to find something a bit more PG, maybe. Parks and recreation. That's what I yeah. have been watching. <laughs> it's just good. Thank you so much for giving up uh, your time to talk to us. Gosh, yeah, it's you've been got, a real treat. Got, Thanks. We were already super fans, and now we're we're even more super fans we, we we wish you every every success in your build up towards the olympics yeah, good luck well, thank you so much thanks i appreciate that take care thanks bye bye thank you <laughs> see you later thanks bye. Bye. bye bye
Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a real treat for Eddie and I to catch up with Elise and, you know, just hearing what it's like, kind of the life of an elite athlete, um, international travel, trying to recover well, doing the sessions, no matter where she's in the world. And I just thought it was really great to hear how the professional side of being an athlete and how maybe you could apply that to non-professional athletes like like everybody else or most of us anyway um so yeah we just thought we'd have a chat about that really what it's like to kind of make your training maybe a bit more professional yeah i came away from the interview feeling a little bit um uh not only in awe but also sort of like inspired as well thinking gosh there's so much more i could put into my training and my general lifestyle than sometimes this muddled hash <laughs> goes through each day so I thought like how can I sort of get that into my lifestyle perhaps a little bit more I like to think that I do I take my slots of life very seriously so I take my training really seriously it always gets done it gets done to the best of my ability I take my parenting quite seriously I mean it can yeah. be quite laxadal is that a word? But, it, yeah. you know, I'm always looking for the best for my children. You know, I always put my kids first, as we all do as parents. And everything else, my work, the, everything else that you have to juggle when you've got a family and, uh, and a house and all that sort of stuff. You know, I always try and do everything the best I can be is individual blocks. But actually, sometimes I'll get to training and I won't have fed myself properly into that session or yeah. I won't recover yeah. properly or I will do a really hard session knowing that I've got a really busy day ahead of me and I won't have time to recover. So yeah. I think there's little tips and tricks that you can do. You make a good point with all of the other things in life to juggle. We you know we're going to talk a bit about being more professional, but you can only be as professional as your life will allow. Um, you know, a good example, we did the Bob Graham round recce at the weekend and my friend was straight into a night shift. Um, and then that night shift extended a bit longer than he thought. So instead of getting home at three o'clock, he got home at five o'clock. And then, so all the will in the world, some things kind of go against you. And I'm sure there's lots of athletes, this was another uh, thread of my thinking, that do not have, you know, you hear about people who've got full-time jobs and yeah. still manage to get to the Olympics and do amazing things. And yeah. uh, and sometimes also that, that works in their favour because sport isn't the be-all and end-all of their life. It's yeah. something that they do as um, very seriously, but they have a lot else going on. And I know lots of people that have tried to turn professional elite athletes and they failed because they can't cope with the mental downtime of being with nothing else to do. There's nothing else to think about apart from your session. And I think maybe that's why I still love the training and the process because yeah. once it's done, probably a bit like you, it's done, you know, we can reflect on it a bit, but we only have limited time to reflect oh, yeah, on that session before <laughs> there's something else and you move on and you forget about it and you can't harbor the yeah, I don't have the luxury of time to dwell or celebrate. No. So I was just thinking about different ways that we could, I could be a little bit better in my, in my everyday life and definitely rest, listening to my body yeah. and trying to mold it all together a little bit better so that it's not just, to, you know, I take a, a look at the overall day or the overall yeah. week. Like, for instance, now, the next three weeks are not going to be perhaps the most fun for Eddie. Even if time is against you, there's still things you can do better. You know, we could all hopefully get to bed half an hour earlier. And if you, like, if you can't do that, don't just write it off and go to bed at two in the morning. If it's only 15 minutes earlier, just, mm. these, you know, mm. something is better than Little. nothing. Exactly. It takes you just as long to cook maybe a nutritious meal than a non-nutritious meal. So there's things that you can do that maybe don't impact on the time you have available. Um, and they're the things I really try and look at every day. Try and have four portions of vegetables, four portions of fruit. Try and sleep eight hours. Lots of nuts and seeds. Um, don't eat much meat or definitely not processed meat. Fair enough, I appreciate if your disposable income doesn't allow some of these choices, then that's a different kind of consideration too. But the, the, those things that I just mentioned don't really kind of come at a price of time. It's all about planning too, isn't it? I think when we're so busy and at the moment actually planning out i mean i talk about my diary love my diary but even more planning as working out where the slots are going to go and how you're going to do it and yeah. um and getting it done and then just accepting it, it's, it will be what it will be 
But this is all applicable, you know, if, if it's a big goal, if you if this is your big goal and, and it's really, I was going to say a race less than something that you could do to be more professional, but nobody's racing at all at the moment. But in normal situations, I am very guilty of this and being very greedy. I'd like to run a fast 5K and I'd like to run a fast 100 miler. If I was being more professional, then maybe I wouldn't focus on lots and lots of different things. But then on the flip side, I know so many people who don't look at running as this kind of competitive outlet in their life it is a, a social a well-being maybe even something they used to kind of manage their mental mental health and for those people if they're getting different things from running then it doesn't really matter that you're not being as professional there are lots of things that people get out of running so but if like i say if you are going for a big goal then maybe try and be a bit sharpen things up a bit but if you are running for, for fulfillment um then don't don't beat yourself up if you go to bed at half past twelve <laughs> and stuff. We've like all that. got to do that sometimes. Yeah. Don't start yeah. watching. We've just started watching from the beginning. What is it? Line of Duty with the cops. Have oh, you ever watched that? I've no, I've never seen it. I've heard it's really good. Um, I'll probably really watch it in about good. five years' time. Yeah, well, we we they've still got like text phones that we started series one. That's right. how long ago it was made. It's great, <laughs> uh, but it's it's because they're an hour long episode. Who watches an hour long episode? Jesus, take, not only does it get late, take some concentration for poor edits. Not for yeah. you and Rex. Yes. No, well. no, like, like it, you couldn't fall asleep in front of that. <laughs> anyway, hope you enjoyed that interview with Elise. We loved it. Give her a follow on social media. Um, let her know that you enjoyed it because she gave her a lot of time, didn't she? she did, talking yes. to us. She's juggling lots of things and making it work at the moment. So that's good. What's coming up, Gary? What is coming up? Oh, I've got a uh, little beard a, tidy, maybe by uh, the looks yeah. of it. A little trim there. It's white, isn't it? I don't mind the white. It's bristling against the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> the interference on the mic. Um, yeah, I've got a few days in London, so that's been quite pleasant. Um, on my own, unfortunately, a bit of work and I'm, I, I need to, I don't need to crazy, but um. I'm hoping to do a, an interval session. So I think it's 10 minutes and then five times 1K, then another 10 minutes at the end. Um, so I've just been Googling best park in London for, for running. Oh, now where are you staying? Because I used to live in London. I'm right in Covent Garden, right in the middle. Oh, you're right in the middle. Hmm. Well, I would probably head out St. James's Park, Hyde Park. Okie doke, yeah. That's what I, I wonder if they've got little signs, little, like one mile markers or something i think you'll find london has a lot of signs gary Ooh, yeah yeah <laughs> but i'm going to be with my gopro so if you see someone running around with a gopro <laughs> filming all the landmarks then um then i'll do that but i did you know when i said about the bob graham round i filmed it all leg one and the plan oh, is cool. to to release it on youtube as a like a navigation tool for, hmm. for people um so i'm going to do all of leg one but then i'm going to chop it up from summit to summit because otherwise who wants to watch three and a half hours on youtube of some 47 year old man huffing and puffing <laughs> around the tree. People will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never know. So then I'm going to do, say, Keswick to Skiddaw, Skiddaw to Calvert, and Calvert to Blencather and Blencather to Felker. So it's little kind of bite sized navigation chunks. Because Brilliant. Not everybody lives in the lakes, and a lot of people are interested in the Bob Graham round. So I think it might be a little navigational tool for some people out there. Um, and then the usual, I've got a threshold run tonight. So. We'll get that done. And yourself, what's coming up? What's oh, coming up? Survival. <laughs> Survival. Uh, I'm just working out how I can fit in. Um, obviously, my, my training has take a bit of a hit the next few weeks. Um, but so it's going to be all about quality, but getting the right amount of quality with, with the limited amount of rest during the day, yeah, you know, yeah. so I'm really going to be kind to myself. So I've had, so a couple more days. So normally I could probably do a hard session, recovery day and then yeah. probably a bit more i probably do like two really hard sessions a week but this to the next few weeks i'm just gonna f just have one okay so tomorrow is a that'll big, be on the road um, though two two road two running sessions or two road, road. <laughs> road. uh yeah so now now it will be no more skiing now um yeah. so it will all be so i did a big bike session yesterday <sighs> <laughs> haven't done that for a long time um and then i've got a big treadmill run to do tomorrow uh we've actually just had a cold icy blast come through so we've got yeah. some snow back so we'll be on the treadmill tomorrow but it's an hour and 45 minutes long of oh uphill running but you know it's an hour and 45 where it's just me my airpods spotify <laughs> greatest hits <Yeah. laughs> best rock ballads 
Ooh. I will be fine. <laughs> I won't have a problem Classic getting that done. And then um, and then I'm going to start adding on my long run. So I did uh, just under 16 miles last week. Yep. Oh, I was stiff the next day after that, talking about DOMS. I haven't run that. F- that's my longest run this year. Yeah. So uh, I start adding up um, trails clearing. So I will start adding up long runs at the weekend. Yes. Yeah. As long as as long as I can escape for till they find me, it could be like six <laughs> hours till I get the WhatsApp. When are you back? Right, well, have a great us. week. Yeah, Survive. yeah, and you. And that was episode thirty-two week. of the Run to the Hills podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, everybody. I had a blast as usual. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Gaza. I'm Eddie Sutton, and I'm Gary Thwaites. And let's run to the hills. Bye.